Chapter Three of Book Thirteen of Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patricia Hayes. Les Miserables, Volume Four by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Thirteen. Marius enters the shadow. Chapter Three. Marius had reached the Alla. There, everything was still calmer, more obscure, and more motionless than in the neighboring streets. One would have said that the glacial peace of the sepulchre had sprung forth from the earth, and had spread over the heavens. Nevertheless, a red glow brought out against this black background the lofty roofs of the houses which barred the Rue de la Chanfrie on the saint eustache side it was the reflection of the torch which was burning in the corinth barricade marius directed his steps toward that red light it had drawn him to the marshal pori and he caught a glimpse of the dark mouth of the rue des prechères he entered it the insurgent sentinel who was guarding the other end did not see him he felt that he was very close to that which he had come in search of and he walked on tiptoe in this manner he reached the elbow of that short section of the Rue Montour, which was, as the reader will remember, the only communication which Enjolras had preserved with the outside world. At the corner of the last house, on his left, he thrust his head forward and looked into the fragment of the Rue Montour. A little beyond the angle of the lane and the Rue de la Chancrie, which cast a broad curtain of shadow in which he was himself engulfed, he perceived some light on the pavement, a bit of the wine-shop, and beyond, a flickering lamp within a sort of shapeless wall, and men crouching down with guns on their knees. All this was ten fathoms distant from him. It was the interior of the barricade. The houses which bordered the lane on the right concealed the rest of the wine-shop, the large barricade, and the flag from him. Marius had but a step more to take. Then the unhappy man seated himself on a post, folded his arms, and fell to thinking about his father. He thought of that heroic Colonel Pontmercy, who had been so proud a soldier, who had guarded the frontier of France under the Republic, and had touched the frontier of Asia under Napoleon, who had beheld Genoa, Alexandra, Milan, Turin, Madrid, Vienna, Dresden, Berlin, Moscow, who had left on all the victorious battlefields of Europe drops of that same blood which he, Marius, had in his veins, who had grown grey before his time and discipline and command, who had lived with his sword-belt buckled, his epaulets falling on his breast, his cockade blackened with powder, his brow furrowed with his helmet, in barracks, in camp, in the bivouac, in ambulances, and who, at the expiration of twenty years, had returned from the great wars with a scarred cheek, a smiling countenance, tranquil, admirable, pure as a child, having done everything for France, and nothing against her. He said to himself that his day had also come now, that his hour had struck, that following his father he too was about to show himself brave, intrepid, bold, to run to meet the bullets, to offer his breast to bayonets, to shed his blood, to seek the enemy, to seek death, that he was about to wage war in his turn and descend to the field of battle, and that the field of battle upon which he was to descend was the street, and that the war in which he was about to engage was civil war. He beheld civil war laid open like a gulf before him, and into this he was about to fall. Then he shuddered. He thought of his father's sword, which his grandfather had sold to a second-hand dealer, and which he had so mournfully regretted. He said to himself that that chase and valiant sword had done well to escape from him, and to depart in wrath into the gloom, that if it had thus fled, 
it was because it was intelligent and because it had foreseen the future that it had had a presentiment of this rebellion the war of the gutters the war of pavements fusillades through cellar windows blows given and received in the rear it was because coming from marengo and friedland it did not wish to go to the rue de la chanvrerie it was because after what it had done with the father it did not wish to do this for the son he told himself that if that sword were there if after taking possession of it at his father's pillow he had dared to take it and carry it off for this combat of darkness between frenchmen in the streets it would assuredly have scorched his hands and burst out of flame before his eyes like the sword of the angel he told himself that it was fortunate that it was not there that it had disappeared that that was well that that was just that his grandfather had been the true guardian of his father's glory and that it was far better that the colonel's sword should be sold at auction sold to the old clothes man thrown among the old junk than it should to-day wound the side of his country and then he fell to weeping bitterly this was horrible but what was he to do live without cosette he could not since she was gone he must needs die had he not given her his word of honour that he would die she had gone knowing that this meant that it pleased her that marius should die and then it was clear that she no longer loved him since she had departed thus without warning without a word without a letter although she knew his address what was the good of living and why should he live now then what should he retreat after going so far should he flee from danger after having approached it should he slip away after having come and peeped into the barricade slip away all in a tremble saying after all i have had enough of it as it is i have seen it that suffices this is civil war and i shall take my leave should he abandon his friends who were expecting who were in need of him possibly who were a mere handful against an army should he be untrue at once to his love to country to his word should he give to his cowardice the pretext of patriotism but this was impossible and if the phantom of his father was there in the gloom and beheld him retreating he would beat him on the loins with the flat of his sword and shout to him march on you poltroon thus a prey to the conflicting movements of his thoughts he dropped his head all at once he raised it a sort of splendid rectification had just been effected in his mind there is a widening of the sphere of thought which is peculiar to the vicinity of the grave it makes one see clearly to be near death the vision of the action into which he felt that he was perhaps on the point of entering appeared to him no more as lamentable but as superb the war of the street was suddenly transfigured by some unfathomable inward working of his soul before the eye of his thought all the tumultuous interrogation points of reverie recurred to him in throngs but without troubling him he left none of them unanswered let us see why should his father be indignant are there not cases where insurrection rises to the dignity of duty what was there that was degrading for the son of Colonel Pontmercy in the combat which was about to begin? It is no longer Montmiral nor Champaubert. It is something quite different. The question is no longer one of sacred territory, but of a holy idea. The country wails that may be, but humanity applauds. But is it true that the country does wail? France bleeds, but liberty smiles and in the presence of liberty's smile france forgets her wound and then if we look at things from a still more lofty point of view why do we speak of civil war civil war what does that mean is there a foreign war is not all war between men war between brothers war is qualified only by its object there is no such thing as foreign or civil war there is only just and unjust war until that day when the grand human agreement is concluded war that at least which is the effort of the future which is hastening on against the past which is lagging in the rear may be necessary what have we to reproach that war with 
war does not become a disgrace the sword does not become a disgrace except when it is used for assassinating the right progress reason civilization truth then war whether foreign or civil is iniquitous it is called crime outside the pale of that holy thing justice by what right does one form of man despise another by what right should the sword of washington disown the pike of camille de molay leonidas against the stranger timoleon against the tyrant which is greater the one is the defender the other the liberator shall we brand every appeal to arms within a city limits without taking the object into a consideration then note the infamy of brutus marcel arnold von blankenheim calling the hedgerow war war of the streets why not that was the war of ambriori of artveld of marny of pelagius but ambriori fought against rome Artveld against France, Marny against Spain, Pelagius against the Moors, all against the foreigner. Well, the monarchy is a foreigner, oppression is a stranger, the right divine is a stranger, despotism violates the moral frontier, and invasion violates geographical frontier. Driving out the tyrant or driving out the English, in both cases regaining possession of one's own territory. There comes an hour when protestation no longer suffices. After philosophy, action is required. Live force finishes what the idea has sketched out. Prometheus' chain begins. Aristotelian begins. The encyclopedia enlightens souls. The 10th of August electrifies them. After Aeschylus, Tharosibulus. After Diderot, Danton. Multitudes have a tendency to accept the master. Their mass bears witness to apathy. A crowd is easily led as a whole to obedience. Men must be stirred up, pushed on, treated roughly by the very benefit of their deliverance. Their eyes must be wounded by the true. Light must be hurled at them in terrible handfuls. They must be a little thunderstruck themselves at their own well-being. This dazzling awakens them. Hence the necessity of toxins in wars. Great combatants must rise, must enlighten nations with audacity, and shake up that sad humanity which is covered with gloom by the right divine, Caesarian glory, force, fanaticism, irresponsible power, and absolute majesty. A rabble stupidly occupied in the contemplation, in their twilight splendor of these somber triumphs of the night. Down with the tyrant! Of whom are you speaking? Do you call Louis-Philippe the tyrant? No, no more than Louis the Sixteenth. Both of them are what history is in the habit of calling good kings. But principles are not to be parcelled out. The logic of the true is rectilinear. The peculiarity of truth is that it lacks complacence. No concessions, then. All encroachments on man should be repressed. There is a divine right in Louis the Sixteenth. There is because a bourbon in Louis Philippe both represent in a certain measure the confiscation of right and in order to clear away universal insurrection they must be combated it must be done france being always the one to begin when the master falls in france he falls everywhere in short what cause is more just and consequently what war is greater than that which re-establishes social truth restores throne to liberty restores the people to the people restores sovereignty to man replaces the purple on the head of france restores equity and reason in their plenitude suppresses every germ of antagonism by restoring each one to himself annihilates the obstacle which royalty presents to the whole immense universal concord, and places the human race once more on a level with the right. These wars build up peace. An enormous fortress of prejudices, privileges, superstitions, lies, exactions, abuses, violences, iniquities, and darkness still stand erect in this world with its towers of hatred. It must be cast down. This monstrous mass must be made to crumble. To conquer at Austerlitz is grand. To take the Bastille is immense. There is no one who has not noticed it in his own case, the soul, and therein lies the marvel of its 
unity complicated with ubiquity, has a strange aptitude for reasoning almost coldly in the most violent extremities, and it often happens that heartbroken passion and profound despair in the very agony of their blackest monologues treat subjects and discuss theses. Logic is mingled with convulsion, and the thread of syllogism floats, without breaking, in the mournful storm of thought. This was the situation of Marius's mind. As he meditated thus, dejected but resolute, hesitating in every direction, and in short shuddering at what he was about to do, his glance strayed to the interior of the barricade. The insurgents were there, conversing in a low voice, without moving, and there was perceptible that quasi-silence which marks the last stage of expectation. Overhead, at the small window in the third story, Marius descried a sort of spectator who appeared to him to be singularly attentive. This was the porter who had been killed by Le Cabouc. Below, by the lights of the torch which was thrust between the paving stones, this head could be vaguely distinguished. Nothing could be stranger in that sombre and uncertain gleam than that vivid, motionless, astonished face with its bristling hair, its eyes fixed and staring, and its yawning mouth bent over the street in an attitude of curiosity. One would have said that the man who was dead was surveying those who were about to die. A long trail of blood which had flowed from that head descended in reddish threads from the window to the height of the first floor, where it stopped. End of Book Thirteen Chapter 3